I just want to welcome everybody to another family workshop here at Family Partnership. I am super excited and a little bit nervous to host one of my favorite Instagrammers, Amber O'Neill Johnston. And I just want to introduce her by telling you why I love her so much and why I asked her to come. So um, she has the most amazing Instagram. And if you don't have Instagram, you should head over there as quick as possible because she has recommended so many amazing books. I found her and started reading some of the books that she suggested and they're so phenomenal that then I just kept reading and she's full of so much truth and goodness and beauty. And every time I read one of her posts, I just feel like I want to be a better homeschooling mom. So when I reached out to Amber to ask if she'd come and talk to us, I was super excited when she said yes, because I feel like every time she opens her mouth, I just walk away feeling equipped. So Amber, thank you for coming. Thank you for talking to us. I'm going to stop talking because people are here for you. Hey, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I will first tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my husband, Scott, and I live um, outside of Atlanta in Georgia. I'm from Illinois. He's from Ohio, but we met here and we met at the art museum. And in a little while, you'll know why that's so significant for where we are now in our lives. We have four children. Um, they are 12, 10, 8, and 6. The older two are girls, the younger two are boys. And we have been homeschooling from the beginning. And we have specifically been using the Charlotte Mason philosophy or Charlotte Mason method of education also from the beginning. So um, in the early days, uh, my husband is the one who wanted to homeschool. Um, I thought he was completely crazy. The first five times he mentioned it, I really legitimately thought he was kidding. I would not have laughed in his face as I did. Um, but it just was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. We had never discussed anything like that. It just came out of the blue one day. And I, I, I just ignored him. I was like, <laughs> Oh, you're funny. And I did that like five times. And finally he's like, I'm so serious. I was like, I'm so not doing that. And, um, so here I am. Um, he said, let's try it for a year and see. And I tried it for a year and fell in love. So as I was preparing to do this thing that I swore I was never going to do, um, I had no, idea. I was like, how do you homeschool? What is that all about? And like maybe the first night probably that I researched homeschooling, I found this blog post and it had like a kind of quiz. And it was kind of like, if you like this, 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 and this, you might like this style of homeschooling. If you like this, 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 and this, you might like that. And then there was one that's like, lovely and beautiful and all wonderful. And it said, you might like Charlotte Mason. I was like, I do. I have no idea who she is, but tell me more. Um, and so I ordered a couple of books and I started learning and I had an infant at the time, um, was my youngest. And so nursing at night, I had plenty of time to read. I wasn't on social media or anything. I have social media accounts. So, um, I was reading all the stuff and I started reading about her educational philosophy at the same time. I was reading, um, a, a book by Richard Louvre called last child in the woods. And he talks about how our children are living in the midst of a nature deficit and kind of what that's doing, their lack of time outside. And um, he goes on and on and it makes a really compelling argument. And as someone who was born and raised in the air conditioning, um, I was very convicted about that, but didn't really know what to do with it. Like, I, I believe that my kids needed a lot of time outside, but I didn't really know what to do outside other than go to the playground. And they would like get bored. Like we'd get all packed up and go to the playground and then like 18 minutes, they're like, oh, we're ready to go. And I'm like, but it took us like 25 minutes to get here. Um, so we, you know, I, I, I was reading and trying to figure out what does this mean? How do I raise children who are comfortable in the outdoors? And so all of that was happening at the same time. And this is where I landed on the idea of a living education. And that's what I want to share with you tonight. So if you uh, maybe you already know a lot about Charlotte Mason, and um, if so, then this may be a bit of a refresher and you might want to chime in and, and add to the conversation. Um, but if you have never heard of her, then um, I am so excited to introduce you tonight. 
So uh, there is a book that a lot of people, a lot of people who use Charlotte Mason read before they read anything that she wrote. And it's called For the Children's Sake. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but this is the first book that I ordered because that quiz I took that night said, if, you, if this sounds good to you, you think you like Charlotte Mason, you should read this book. And um, it was written by Susan Schaefer Macaulay. And some of the things that she said, some are very inspirational and some are just so practical. And it spoke to me. And in the book, she introduced really Americans to Charlotte Mason. And one of her quotes, she says, no parent, home, child, teacher, school has an all round 100% wholeness. We all have limitations and problems, but I must never think it is all or nothing. Perhaps I'd like to live in the country, but I don't. Well, maybe I can get the family to a park two times a week and out to the country once every two weeks. Maybe I have to send my child to a not so good school. Well, maybe we can read one or two good books together aloud. If you can't give them everything, give them something. So that really spoke to me because some of the ideas behind my hesitancy to homeschool, I mean, I had a bunch of things that kids are going to be weird and I'm never going to get to go to the gym and, you know, some of these things, but the deeper things behind it were, were really rooted in my sense of inadequacy that I won't be able to give my children all of the grand things that I want for them. And so reading her words about the idea that no parent, home, school, or teacher has an all round 100% wholeness. Um, and she talked about um, that education does not mean that children are a blank sheet of paper on which they imprint their ideas and impressions and knowledge. Neither does it mean leaving the child unattended like a weed growing in a sidewalk. It is a balanced understanding of education as the provision of possibilities for a person to build relationships with a vast number of things and thoughts. And so I was thinking, yes, I, I'm, a, I'm attracted to that idea um, that my children are not just empty vessels to memorize things or to me to pour facts into them or you know, memorize and regurgitate, which is what I did in school. And it worked quite well. I was a straight A student all the way through, but what did I walk away with? I walked away with being a kind of boring person in my early adult years when I graduated from college, I don't know what I'm interested in. What do I like to read? I don't know. I just read whatever the teacher tells me to read to get an A. Um, what do I want to learn about? Uh, nothing, because I'm not going to get an A. I finished school already. And so I was thinking, okay, I don't want that for my children. So that attracted me. And then finally, just a bit of her sense of humor and understanding of children. So she's talking about it here at an art museum. Don't try to get him to see everything. You'll give him pictorial indigestion. One sure way of making a person hate apples is to take him to an orchard at 9 a.m. and force feed him apples until noon. Indeed, the revulsion may last a lifetime. So it is with pictures and museums. And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I try to take my kids to the art museum. They don't want to be there all day long. And I said, okay, so my children are not um, strange, uncultured little beings, but this is normal and it's not the children. It was my approach. So these are the types of things that I was reading. And that's what led me to wanting to dig deeper into who Charlotte Mason was. So please behave computer. I am clicking on the next slide here. There we go. So who is Charlotte Mason? She um, is a, was a British educator who espoused a relational education in a living environment filled with books, experiences, nature, and ideas where the child is viewed as a person and the educator as one who cooperates with God. And when you are looking online, you'll find most resources dealing with Charlotte Mason are going to have that spiritual component because that's ultimately what she believed. But there is also a website called Wildwood. Um, and the woman who runs that, it's years and years of blog posts, also curriculum ideas and book recommendations. Um, 
um, from a secular perspective as well. Um, and so there is something out there for everybody. So the Charlotte Mason method is based on her belief that children are born persons and that we must educate the whole person, not just their minds. This is totally different than school where I was just memorizing and regurgitating. That's all that mattered. No one was wondering what my passions were or no one was really working on my character. As long as I wasn't a bully and I didn't show up late, that was good enough. Um, and no one was really concerned about the atmosphere of the classroom or the school that I was in. Um, so a Charlotte Mason education is three pronged. In her words, she says, education is an atmosphere, a discipline, and a life. And you will hear that over and over again. So trying to spend an evening with you, telling you um, all about the Charlotte Mason philosophy is like if spending an hour and someone say, tell me how to homeschool. There's so much to it. And there are so many things I won't even touch upon tonight. But uh, the core of her method and her philosophy are, lie in those three areas that education is an atmosphere, a discipline, and a life. So by atmosphere, she meant the surroundings in which the child grows up. So a child absorbs a lot from their home environment. And Charlotte believed that the ideas that rule your life as the parent make up a full one third of your children's education. So we haven't talked about book the first, we're just talking about, and that's a full one third, the atmosphere. So uh, your child doesn't need a special kind of age segregated or controlled environment in which to learn. The natural atmosphere of your home provides a big part of your child's education as a person. And she described it this way. She said, when we say that education is an atmosphere, we don't mean that a child should be isolated in what may be called a child environment, specially adapted and prepared, but that we should take into account the educational value of his natural home atmosphere both as regards persons and things, and should let him live freely among his proper conditions. That is so freeing because basically what she's saying is where your child is is right where your child belongs. And your home, your atmos the atmosphere of your home, home is not just like, okay, like you can make that your kid will be okay even though they're home. It's that it's the ideal place um, from which your child can be educated. It's a, key component of your child's education. And that is something I share with families who, whose children are in school as well. Um, their home atmosphere still is one third of the process of their education. Um, so uh, in other words, children will learn a lot from having natural firsthand experiences with the people and the things that are already in your home. And so she went on to say that, um, every look of gentleness and tone of reverence and every word of kindness and act of help passes into the thought environment. The very atmosphere which the child breathes, he does not think of these things, may never think of them, but all his life long, they excite that vague appetency towards something out of which most, most of his actions spring. So our home atmosphere isn't necessarily something where our children will look back and be like, oh, it was the atmosphere of my home. It was the placement of this and the way my mother said this. These are, these are things that like seep in to them just naturally. The best way that I can describe it um, would be when I was breastfeeding my children and my mom who didn't breastfeed, you know, she's looking and seeing me struggle a little bit in the beginning with each baby. And she's like, oh my gosh, why don't you just like give the baby formula? And I was like, mom, it's fine. I totally will. I mean, I know that I can do that. I don't have a problem with that, but I'd like to continue trying. And she would always say, what is the big deal? They're not going to remember this. And I told her, I know they're not going to remember the receiving that milk but they are going to remember um, or they're going to always know this like closeness. Like they're going to have, they're going to be changed because of this closeness. And that's why I felt like I knew it wasn't about the milk because I could hold my baby close and look in her eyes and all of that without it. And I felt secure, but I said, I know that this moment is changing her. And it's very much like that with your home atmosphere. Um, and she went on uh, to say that we all know the natural conditions under which a child should live. 
how he shares household ways with his mother, romps with his father, is teased by his brothers and petted by his sisters, is taught by his tumbles, learns self-denial by the baby's needs, the delightfulness of furniture by playing at battle and siege with sofa and table, learns veneration for the old by the visits of his great-grandmother, how to live with his equals by the chums he gathers around him. He learns intimacy with animals from his dog and cat, delights in the fields where the buttercups grow and greater delight in the blackberry hedges. So these are just the normal everyday um, rhythms of daily life, okay? And she held those up and honored them um, to the same degree as the pure academics. So let me see before I go on to that one. Um, all of these relationships with the people and things that we're talking about, um, Charlotte Mason said that those would shape um, who the child is becoming. So today we would call that our family culture, right? That's how we would say it. She didn't use that language, but our family culture. And interestingly, you know, the atmosphere of your home, it doesn't depend on the number of kids you have or where you live or how nice your house is or, or even whether you're home all the time or you travel a lot. It's none of those things, whether you live in the country or whether you're in a suburban house or a condo or an apartment, um, all of those things are just considered packaging. Okay, none of those things are the things that she's talking about, about home atmosphere. Um, no matter what your situation, it, the culture of your family, your home atmosphere is made up of one thing and only one thing. And those are the ideas that rule your life as the parent. So the ideas that rule your life will permeate the atmosphere of your home. And it's almost as if your child breathes in, you know, those ideas. And so, and um, in one way, it's very lovely to think that your, your home atmosphere plays such a huge role with your children and how natural that form of education and living is. It's also quite scary because what she's saying, what you value is what your children will learn to value. So if you, your home atmosphere is one in which your face is always in your screen, then your children will learn that a home is a place where people have their faces in the screens. If your home atmosphere is one of a lot of yelling and demeaning when the children don't do what you want them to do, then your children will learn that that's their home atmosphere. Um, and so when you think about how much weight that has, it gives you such an inspiration to be very intentional and not to be a superwoman, but to think clearly and critically about the way you respond, about the things in your home, about the decisions you make and how your family spends their time. Um, and you, it doesn't mean that you become perfect, but you do become convicted. So, you know, a perfect example for me, um, a lot of times when I'm blogging and doing all this stuff and speaking, or I'm here with you right now or getting ready for this. And one of my children would come to me and say, mama. And I'm like, what? And I see that droop in their face of like, you know, sadness. And the worst is when they say, never mind and walk away. And I realized, well, here I am doing all of this work to talk and research and be about homeschooling, but my kids don't care about any of that. What they wanted was my eye contact and that moment of attention. Those are the things that begin to convict you. So not, I just told you, I did that multiple times. It's not that it never happens, but when you start becoming intentional about your home atmosphere, you won't just let that hang. You will apologize and you'll want to do it differently next time. Um, so it can be a bit overwhelming when we think of all the implications of this idea that education is an atmosphere built on who we are as persons and the ideas that rule our lives. But she didn't just say it was an atmosphere. She also said that education is a discipline. And by discipline, she meant the discipline of good habits, the spe specifically the habits of character. So cultivating good habits in your child's life make up another third of a Charlotte Mason education. So the home atmosphere, next you have the habits, the discipline, the character building. Um, atmosphere is all about the firsthand experiences your child receives from that daily interaction with the people and ideas around them. Well, discipline is about giving your child instruction and practice about the best ways to interact with those people and things and those ideas around him. So think of um, discipline as like guide rails or kind of controls 
Um, and we set those guides in place to help our children navigate life with you know, the minimum amount of mishaps or obstacles. That's what we want for them. Um, and Charlotte compared the discipline of habits to railroad tracks. She said, habit is to life what rails are to transport cars. So the cars of a train can run smoothly on those rails to get to where they need to go. And it's the same with good habits that we cultivate in our children's lives. They act as guide rails to help our children advance smoothly through life. Um, and that's why Charlotte specified that these habits should be formed definitely and thoughtfully. Those were her words. Um, so much of what we do and what our children do each day, we do out of habit. We think certain ways, we act certain ways, because that's how we're accustomed to thinking and acting. Um, and so those guide rails make up such a large part of our lives that it doesn't make sense to just leave it up to chance. Um, and that's what happens most of the time when we're not intentional. It's like, oh, you know, we'll say something to the kids, make sure you say please and thank you or whatever. We'll throw a few polite things. But when you really think, okay, one third of my child's education is the formation of good habits. And what am I doing to show that level of importance in our home? Um, she says here, that second quote there, that nine times out of 10, we begin to do a thing because we see someone else do it and we go on doing it and there's the habit. If it's so easy for ourselves to take up a new habit, it is tenfold as easy for the children. And that's good because we always think of good habits, but it's tenfold as easy for them to pick up bad habits as well. And she says that children are always forming habits, good or bad. So even if we don't do the habit training, they're still forming habits. They're just not going to be the ones that we want them to be forming. Um, so the fact is that the many things, the things that we do a good many times over leave some sort of impression in the very substance of our brain. And this impression, the more often it's repeated, makes it easier for us to do the thing the next time. We know this well enough as it applies to skating, hockey, and the like. We say we want practice or, or we are out of practice and must get some practice, but we do not realize that in all the affairs of our life, the same thing holds good. What we have practice in doing, we can do with ease while we bungle over that in which we have little practice. This is the law of habit, which holds good as much in doing kindnesses as in playing the piano. Both habits come by practice. And that is why it's so important not to miss a chance of doing the thing we mean to do well. So I know that's a long quote, but a lot of times it's very hard to tell someone about Charlotte Mason and not to, to use her words because she's very specific. She never gives extra words and she never leaves out words. And so you can see, we talk about practicing piano if you wanna do better, practicing hockey if you wanna be an expert. She's saying practice kindness, practice patience, practice attentiveness to the same degree. That's the one third aspect of the education. So practice is crucial to improving um, in anything, and that's part of what she's basing her entire philosophy on. So you want to decide what habits you want to cultivate in your child's life, what guide rails you want to lay down that will help your child to run smoothly through life. So some of the things I just named, it could be attention, obedience, truthfulness, um, respect, initiative, giving best effort, self-control, gratitude, fortitude. These are all the types of things that we would do. And, and we don't just try to tackle those all at once, right? Because we're actually human living people and that would be impossible. But you and your child would totally get overwhelmed as anybody would. So you just pick one habit. So you're starting with one habit and you focus on practicing on that one habit for two months and get the guide rail laid smoothly and everything running. And then you pick another one and go to work repeating that one and practicing that one for two months, right? It's slow and steady. We're building year over year, month over month for a whole entire childhood, which will lead to a lifetime. And furthermore, she goes on and, and talks about, we can do this with our own lives too. Um, so one at a time, that's how you build the guide rails of good habit. And that's how you educate your child in good character um, because the habits of the child produce the character of the man. And that's the ultimate aspect of that second part. And then finally, the third aspect, education is an atmosphere, a discipline and a life. So by a life, she means that, um, that it applies to academics, 
And so now we're finally getting to the part that most people will start with and say homeschooling is about academics. And now that's one third of what she talks about. And uh, she believed that we should give children living thoughts and ideas, not just dry facts. So all of her methods for teaching the various school subjects are built around that single concept. So in saying that education is a life, the need of intellectual and moral, as well as of physical sustenance is implied. The mind feeds on ideas and therefore children should have a generous curriculum. So that thought of the mind feeding on ideas, that's like a kind of fun part or something that a lot of people are really attracted to with the Charlotte Mason education. So think about when you were in school, think about your like history textbook or even like your like science textbook. This is an amoeba. Here are the traits. This is a nucleus of a cell. This is a mitochondria. Here's the definition. Here's a picture. Moving on. Okay. And compare that to what she would say, like those boring dry facts. No, it would be like the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. And it'll be a story that like tells you all about this powerhouse and what it does and who first discovered it and what, how it operates and comparing it to other things that a child would understand the powerhouse. It's like the battery that, that, you know, that energizes your, you know, whatever, whatever, and goes on. It's really interesting. And so these are these types of books. Um, these living books are, are the types of books that your child doesn't want you to put down or stop reading. And I don't know about you, but there was never a textbook in school that I didn't want my teacher to stop reading. Um, so this is very different. Um, you see, ideas give our children something to chew on, to mull over. They provide sustenance to the mind. Um, I'm a registered dietitian by trade, and Charlotte Mason talks so much about food all throughout her, her books. And I'm always like, oh, I feel you on that so much, all these food analogies. But the idea that your body is hungry, your children are fed, you would never think of not feeding them food. They must have food to live. And she says the mind is capable of dealing with only one kind of food. It lives, grows, and is nourished upon ideas only. That is the food for the mind. Mere information is to it as a meal of sawdust to the body. Those dry facts that wrote memorization, those like random things and kind of like, I gotcha tests, those are like sawdust, like a, a, a child trying to survive from eating sawdust. Imagine giving your child a meal of sawdust. That's the idea of a lesson without fresh and good ideas. There's nothing there that's nutritious in sawdust. It can't supply energy for the body and bare facts, rote memorization, dry reading, plain textbooks, they cannot sustain or fuel mental life. Charlotte put it quite succinctly. It cannot be too often said that information is not education. So um, how do we find these ideas and give them to our children? That's like a big thing. I mean, we can all say, oh, this is, sounds really good. I want to feed my kids ideas, but where do they come from? How do we get those? Um, she explained that ideas are not actually material objects that you can touch and handle. They're immaterial or spiritual. They're conveyed from one person to another in various forms. And she said, education is a life. That life is sustained on ideas. Ideas are of spiritual origin and God has made us so that we get them chiefly as we convey them to one another, whether by word of mouth, written page, scripture, musical symphony, but we must sustain a child's inner life with ideas as we sustain his body with food. So even though atmosphere is a, is a, uh, education is an atmosphere, a discipline and a life, and I'm saying life, those are the academics, even still, we still haven't started talking about like actual subjects. A part of this, a lot of her philosophy is about how we teach, not as much about exactly what we're teaching. 
So in a Charlotte Mason education, we give our children a feast of ideas from a wide variety of subjects. We give them books, the written page, right, that convey living ideas, not just those dry facts. We give them scripture and music and art and poetry, and we don't consider those things to be little frills that we can include once in a while if we happen to get along around to it. Those are the source of ideas. Those are what feed the child's mind and heart. So a lot of these, you know, ideas and words, they're coming for directly from Charlotte Mason, but one of my mentors, Sonia Schaefer from Simply Charlotte Mason, these are her um, ideas of like, that she's culled down from Charlotte's massive volumes. And it's just such an easy way to understand um, what she's teaching and, and talking about. Um, there's so much more to Mason's philosophy. Um, but the idea of education being an atmosphere, a discipline, and a life supports all of what we do. And so the question becomes, how does the philosophy play out practically within our homes, those of us who use this? So let's look at those living ideas and methods. Like how do we, what is a living education? How do we take all of these really good sounding things and practically apply them in our four walls? So the first idea, if you've heard anything about Charlotte Mason, you've heard about these living books. Some people roll their eyes. Some people are like, whoo, give me more, give me more. So um, to just demystify them, um, there are, I mean, there's so much that she wrote about it. I can't say all of it tonight, but these questions are things that I ask myself to help understand if what I'm looking through or looking at is a living book. One is the writing of excellent, excellent quality. So, you know, fart boy goes camping or whatever, you can pretty much count that out. That's not going to be one of the living books. That doesn't mean that there's no place in your child's life for that type of book, maybe, but um, there are books, you know, that my kids read in their free time, but I wouldn't count that as a school book. That would not be a living book. I just made that title up, by the way. Somehow that's how I feel about some of the books my boys hand me. Um, does it contain ideas and knowledge suitable for the child? Um, and that doesn't mean dumbed down for the child. Think the opposite, meaty enough for the child. Does the child react with delight caused by the spark of ideas? All of us have experienced that moment when our kid is really into something. And you know, for one of my boys, it's sharks. Honestly, I feel like I can take him to the Atlanta Aquarium and put him toe to toe with whoever their top shark expert is. And I dare him to know more. I dare him because this kid is like really into sharks. And that type of spark of delight comes from something you cannot create. You cannot manufacture it. Sometimes it's a rock, you know, and the kid's like obsessive. Mommy, look at my rock. Look at this. Did you see it? Did you look? Mommy, look at glimmers. Mommy, look at this. I got the rock. I got four of them. Can we go look for more of these rocks? You can't manufacture that type of delight, but you can put before them books that have ideas that are most likely to spark that type of delight and droning on and on in some boring manner is not going to be the move. Um, does the book make an impact on the reader's mind? We'll talk a little bit more about narration in a second, but shown by their ability to tell you and talk about it. Can, can your child read this book and like, get into it enough to describe it and talk to you about it. Does the child need to dig a bit for their knowledge? So it's not like someone chewed their food up for them and pre-digested it and told them all the things that they should think of it. Um, no, they have to kind of work with it. It shouldn't be too hard. They can't understand anything they're reading, but it's not about difficulty level. It could be a very thin book. Um, it could be a simple book, but are the ideas things that make them have something to think about? Um, is the book written by a thinker? So when you think about kind of a dry textbook, you open the front to see who wrote it. It's most often a committee of people just, you know, have been charged to come together and throw this together for us. It has all the facts and they kind of argue and they make a group think and a determination and the school district signs off on it. But a thinker is someone who has really considered the topic that they're writing about. And it's usually going to be interesting because the person who wrote it is interested in that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the original thinker. It can be someone else who is thinking about what they wrote about. So we don't have to read about a philosopher um, read something that a philosopher wrote to read ideas that that philosopher had. Maybe someone today is writing about that in a really interesting way. 
So ultimately living books feed the spirit in some way, thought, feeling, soul, something like that. It's like, oh, those books that give it to you like that. The second concept of living, her living methods were narration. And so we talked about, um, as we have already urged, there is but one right way. Um, that is children must do the work for themselves. They must read the given pages and tell what they have read. They must perform, that is what we may call the act of knowing. So um, as the students, uh, Charlotte Mason would require her students to tell back what they had read or heard um, as they were learning in their own words. Um, and you know that's kind of part of why you have to have a living book because if you have this dry boring book that didn't say much of anything it's very hard to tell it back in your own words. Um, so she didn't have fill in the blanks multiple choice tests or anything like that. They practiced using rich language as they pointed out the ideas that they gleaned from their reading and any mental connections they made while they were doing that and the mental connections between what they just read or what they just heard and things that they had already had residing and growing in their minds and their hearts. So essentially narration is the act of knowing. Um, and that is the student's self-education. During a narration, students take what was read to them or what they read themselves and they own it. It becomes theirs. After thinking and chewing on the material, they digest it by retelling it in their own words. And so it's not a like, let me see if you were paying attention. What did I just say? It's not trying to catch them up. And sometimes children who are first learning to narrate, they might say, well, mama, why do I have to say it to you again? I, you just read it to me, you know what you said. And you have to remind them, oh dear, but it's not for me that you're doing this narration. It is your act of knowing. And you and I can, as adults can have this experience. Sometimes there have been times where I read something and uh, I, I understood it, I thought, but then I try to explain it to someone else and I'm like, uh, uh, I don't really know. I don't really know. It was like, I understood it when they were saying it and I kind of got it. It's like, like right here, but I'm not able to explain it. And ultimately, you know what that means? I don't know. I don't really know. I don't really understand this. So if you can tell someone back something, if you can, um, tell it in your own words, you do know that. So tonight when I'm done talking here, if you talk to a friend or your husband and you're able to tell them about what an education being an atmosphere, a discipline and a life is, you're able to narrate what I shared with you tonight, you'll know that it really soaked in and that you really understood it. Um, and since narration is so powerful, there really is no need for like comprehension questions and oral lectures. Like in a Charlotte Mason education, the teacher doesn't stand up in front and like lecture to them and give them the lesson. So the lessons come through our books and our things and our ideas and, and the child will narrate. In the early years, all of their narrations are oral. And then as they get older, they begin writing their written narrations and like a combination written and oral. So the most common and the monstrous defect in the education of the day is that children fail to acquire the habit of reading. Knowledge is conveyed to them by lessons and talk, but the studious habit of using books as a means of interest and delight is not acquired. Um, so that's, you know, gets to the heart of why often you see so many Charlotte Mason families talking about books and buying books and going to the library to get books and thinking about books and dreaming about books and writing about books and speaking about books. It really comes down to this. this these are our tools of our trade. Um, and that's kind of why we get into it. The next living method is short, uh, short lessons. So Mason believed in creating lessons that would keep the children's attention. So the point of the short lesson wasn't like, let's hurry up and rush through school because school's not important. The point was, we're gonna have a short lesson because I am training you through your habit training and discipline to give your full attention. And it has to be age appropriate. A young child cannot give their full attention to an hour long history lesson. So um, when they're in their 
first few grades. She's uh, Charlotte Mason education begins in first grade. So that's why there's no kindergarten there, but um, you have 15 to 20 minutes maximum and four through six, 20 to 30 minutes. And, and then when they get older, they do, you know, my middle schooler is not doing all five, 10 minute lessons. I mean, it, it, they progress, but never really more, even in high school past them getting past 45 minutes. Um, and so these are relatively short lessons compared to um, what would happen in school in a class period. And to clarify, I'm not going to spend time, I didn't include today what Charlotte Mason says about the early years. I should clarify that formal lessons begin in first grade. So your subjects, you're planning their books and their lessons and this and that, but there are definitely things that you're doing with them ahead of time in those early years namely a lot of time spent outside, which we'll get to shortly, um, and reading to them and all of those things. Um, so one of the things that Mason connected to short lessons was this training of attention. And the reason, the rationale behind that, she thought that it was better to hold a child's attention for a short period of time than to give a long lesson and risk that the child forms a habit of mentally wandering off in the middle of it. So she's basically setting the child up for success. Um, in her schools, these are kind of the, the length, you know, and I see, you see there, I say maximum, some lessons are only 10 minutes, you know, they're not all even up to the maximum. So the next living method, I just kind of mentioned time outdoors. So this is a really long quote, but it's really critical to her philosophy. She's saying long hours, they should be spent outdoors, not two hours, but four or five, six hours they should have on every tolerable fine day from April to October. Impossible, says an overwrought mother who sees her way to no more for her children than a daily hour or so on the pavements of the neighboring London squares. Let me repeat that I venture to suggest not what is practicable in any household, but what seems to me absolutely best for the children and that in the faith in the faith that mothers work wonders once they are convinced that wonders are demanded of them. A journey of 20 minutes by rail or omnibus in a luncheon basket will make a day in the country possible to most town dwellers. And if one day, why not many, even every suitable day? So that quote um, has one of the quotes that has made a lot of people love Mason and a lot of people can't stand her when they read that. Four to six hours a day spent outside, sister, please, okay? And so what do we do with that? And people are wondering, Amber, what do you do with that? I tell you what, we ain't outside for four to six hours a day. That's what I do with that. So she sets a really high standard and I love that. Um, but let's dig into this a little. Let's be critical thinkers. Charlotte Mason lived and worked and wrote in the, at the turn of the 19th century, so late 1800s, early 1900s. Her teaching college where she trained teachers was in Ambleside in the Northwest of England. Um, and so based on that, we can come up with a couple of things right away from context. One, families in the upper and middle classes in the, those areas. So the, she had teachers she was training and then she had families at home that she was sending her correspondence courses to. Um, they would have all had some form of household help. So imagine like what you could do if someone else was like doing your laundry, you know, and getting your stuff done for you, like romp outdoors, darling, of course, but of course. Um, also the climate in Ambleside and England in general is pretty mild. So she lived somewhere, she says from April to October, where the weather was mild, April through October, down here in Georgia, I'll give you April and May, I'll give you September and October, but June, July and August, ain't nobody trying to be outside for four to six hours, you'll die. Um, and what about our Canadian friends? You know, some of my friends out there that are like, I was outside for 20 minutes today. And I know for some of you guys, you know, you might say four to six hours, you've lost your mind. Um, I love Charlotte Mason, and I agree. We don't have to do it that way. Um, but if you are a mother of young children living in England and you have a cook and perhaps a nanny, then I do believe that Charlotte Mason was talking to you when she said that. Um, for the rest of us who don't fit that profile, what are we supposed to do with that? And I think we should look at the principles and not the prescriptions. In this quote, Charlotte Mason is giving us a um, idea that outdoor play 
is very important. The way she laid it out is not directly transferable to our particular situations. It's just not. But there are still principles within this passage that we can and should apply. So I would say the idea that outdoor play for children is incredibly important. We can take that away from that. Outdoor play should be prioritized in line with its value. We should make it an important part of our homeschool, of our home atmosphere, of our children's childhood. And we need to look for what we can do to get our children outside. So the goal is not to tick off the required number of hours spent out each day, but to be the type of family who prioritizes time outdoors. So um, that means we prioritize it over watching TV or um, prioritize it when we're thinking of like extracurricular activities, maybe picking something where our kids will spend time outside um, or prioritize it when we decide what we're going to do for the weekend. Um, and we could sit inside and do something, but we could also do that same thing outside as well. So I have a daughter whose favorite t-shirt says I'm indoorsy because I have a t-shirt that says I'm outdoorsy. And so when she found that, like she had to have it and that's totally okay. But she is a crafter. She's an artist. And I'm always encouraging her. And now it's second to do that outside. I'm not saying you have to run and like hunt squirrels, but you can still reposition yourself to be outdoors. Um, and I believe that, you know, she talks about you can go into the country. If you can do it once, you can do it every day. Um, so what we can take from that is that if we are in concrete suburbia or, um, wherever we may be, that we can challenge our perceived barriers to why our children can't spend more time outside. And we can work on those. So like what keeps us from taking our children out to play? Is it weather? We can, you know, uh, they say like, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. Um, we can get the right apparel, the right gear, a tight schedule. We can clear our schedule. Is it the distance we are from green spaces? Like we can look for ways to overcome that. Um, no one is going to blame you for keeping your child indoors when they would be at risk of frostbite or heat stroke. Um, her concern wasn't about getting children outdoors at all costs, no matter what. That's not even who she is. Nothing in her writing would speak to that. The idea is that she recognized that stretches of outdoor play were necessary for children to develop a relationship with the natural world. And she believed that this relationship was a child's right. Our responsibility as parents is to look for ways to facilitate that relationship in our individual contexts, and it'll be different for each of us. So the next living methods, um, this is our last bit on here, art, music, and handicrafts. You guys, I could come, maybe I'll come back another time. I could have spent the whole night tonight just on those things. Um, I, the idea of art gazing upon beautiful art and creating art, very integral to the Charlotte Mason method. Music, um, listening to music, the great composers, um, and singing music, hymns, and folk songs, um, even your patriotic songs, America the Beautiful. Um, for us, you know, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is known as like the African-American, you know, national anthem, as well as the Star Spangled Banner. So those types of songs that our children wouldn't otherwise learn, but also ache and drum, you know, um, or listening to, uh, you know, Froggy went and Gordon and he did run on. Froggy went and Gordon and he did run on. So like those types of things. And um, tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. I can't sing, but those things, like we're integrating that in. In a Charlotte Mason home, that is a part that's just important as math. Let that soak in. So these are not things we skip and handicrafts, things that our children learn to make with their hands. Charlotte Mason said that they should not be wasteful things. So think of like those like construction paper and like plastic straw crafts at story time at the library. Like, I mean, no knock against it because sometimes sister just trying to survive. I gotta get these kids out of the house. You just gotta go and let somebody else do something with them so you can sit down and drink a latte, even if it's just for like 10 minutes, no problem. But that wouldn't be a handicraft. Might be crafty, but it's the stuff you throw away when your kid's not looking. Those are not handicrafts. Handicrafts are those things that are skill-based. So crocheting, sewing, knitting, cooking, because it's handicrafts and life skills, gardening, 
um, learning to change a flat tire, woodworking, knot tying, friendship bracelets, um, um, pyrography, wood burning, um, clay, beading, making beading ne beaded necklaces and leather crafting, um, all of these types of things, wood whittling, soap whittling you can start out with. My little one whittles with a cheese grater and a bar of soap while the older ones are using their knives and wood. So these are things and she would have ongoing throughout a child's entire education. We switch them about every 12 weeks and sometimes there's one that really sticks and speaks to a child and they can stick with that all along. So my oldest is just coming, I predict in a year that her sewing skills will surpass mine. And so she, I'm teaching her how to learn on her own because I've brought her this far, but she has all the time in the world and I'm a busy mama of four and she has put in her diligence that sewing spoke to her from the moment she touched a needle at age five. So there are some that will stick and some that she, some of our handicrafts, she's like, mom, I'm never, ever doing this again. It's like whack. And I'm like, well, thank you for this 12 weeks that you gave me my Charlotte Mason student child. Don't say that in front of my people or anything like that, but it's okay. Um, so those are very important aspects. And um, finally, a varied feast. Charlotte Mason spread before her students a feast of ideas from a wide variety of sources, from Shakespeare to knitting, to Bible, to tramping through field and stream, to algebra, to singing, to foreign languages. And woven throughout it all, she emphasized the habits of full attention, best effort, and learning for the sake of learning. So these are the ideas that have led so many homeschoolers, including myself, to adopt her philosophy and methods as they seek to educate the whole child. So, um, you know, a lot of times when I come to sessions like this and I'm the person listening, people like talk about all these ideas and great things. But I'm like, OK, if I decide that this spoke to me, what you said tonight, like, what do I do next? So I don't want to leave you hanging. Um, here are some things you could do next. Not all of them, okay? Uh, you're not superwoman. I'm just, just regular. We're just regular moms. Just think which of these one things might speak to you. Oh, I forgot this topic. This is very important. Okay, so this is Charlotte Mason in 1800s England. Some people in America want to do this. If they could find these clothes for their kids, they would put them on them. They want to like be Charlotte Mason. And that is kind of cute. It's also a little bit creepy, but I could even get over that. But that doesn't equip our children for their time and place. Um, and so when you see stuff on, about Charlotte Mason online, like depending on what corner you end up in, a lot of it will be like this. And a lot of the people will be like this. They will tell you, absolutely no iPads you horrible Charlotte Mason mother. And oh my gosh, you don't bake your own bread. Are you eating store-bought bread over there? And they're gonna be like, is your kid reading a graphic novel? Shame, shame, shame. Um, and so to those things, you have to turn that off, whatever your thing may be. I mean, I just made those up because I don't bake my own bread and my kids love graphic novels and all of that. But um, there are thoughts that we have to do things exactly how she did them. And that's not true because our children live in the 21st century in America, in the United States of America. And this is more realistic of their experiences and what their lives are like. And I very much am meaning to make a point in that much of what you see online in Charlotte Mason world is all very rooted in and drenched in European life. And that's okay. My children learn about Rembrandt and Beethoven and my children can recite Emily Dickinson poems and all of that, that's great. But also my children also can recite, you know, uh, Maya Angelou and uh, other artists from the Harlem Renaissance. And my children also study Puerto Rican artists and black artists and women. Um, and they also listen to jazz music and the blues alongside the classical composers. And this is very, very important. And you won't see that a lot in the Charlotte Mason world. So if this is your first introduction, I'm so glad that it's with me so that I can tell you how vitally important this is 
and that I use a lot of examples of Black artists and music and poets and all that because I'm Black. And you should use a lot of examples of whatever background you have. If your grandmother is from Lithuania, girl, you better look up what do they eat? What do they sing? What do they listen, listen to? What are some of their folk tales? Um, if you're half Irish, um, my, my sister-in-law is half Irish and half Italian. Um, and I'm always like with my nieces and nephews and always talking to them about these types of things, like your Italian side, your your Irish side and your black side, you know, and these are all very important aspects of sprinkling all over your child's education, um, because that is what roots them and who they are. And we want our children to have deep roots so that they can spread really wide branches. Okay, so that's an important concept of Charlotte Mason that you're not going to see explicitly described, because remember, she lived in this time, but it's implicitly implied by the way she valued people. So here are some things you can do. Um, you can read her volumes. She wrote these six volumes and you see different pictures. The pink ones were the first to be published here in America. And so your old school kind of Charlotte Mason moms have those. Um, and then you have these really pretty ones that have been published recently. And then another publisher over on the left has these over here. Um, page numbers and all are all the same on all of them because we're all kind of sticklers. If you noticed in all the quotes, I had the name of the volume and the page number. So we keep each other honest and we don't say Charlotte's Said. It's like, where girl, where did she say that? Um, so all the page numbers and all these different volumes are the same, you'll find. Um, maybe you would rather, I mean, she did write, you know, it, England 100 years ago, you have to get used to her volumes. If you want to read something that's more in plain English, these are great books. You know, these are the books I have here by my side when, you know, when I was learning deeply and I still refer to them and read them over at different times. Um, and then there's a fourth one not pictured because the cover's not out yet, Modern Miss Mason by my friend Leah Bowden. Um, it's coming early next year. She's done writing, but it just isn't published yet. Um, and it's going to be a good one because she's going to be talking about bringing those philosophies and methods forward to where we are now. And um, what about a quick guide? If you're like, Amber, anybody got time to read a book? I'm not reading the volumes. I'm not reading the book. I'm really, really busy. Well, this, these are some ideas for you. So um, these are quick things you can get Google or you can take a snapshot of the screen, but 31 Days of Charlotte Mason, it's on a blog with a really experienced homeschool Charlotte Mason mom. She has teenagers and I read her blog and Ambleside Online Patio Chats that's also takes you through all this, so like a one page on a website, it takes you through all these different areas of a Charlotte Mason education. And then Leah Bowden, I just mentioned, she's writing this modern Miss Mason book. She has a little class online called Charlotte Mason Unboxed. These are very, very good things. It's like what I went over with you, but way more detailed and much more information. And you don't have to worry about like, if you're just too st starved for like time to sit down and read books, you know, necessarily right now. Um, and I want to tell you something like you, when you're in Charlotte Mason world, it's just like everything else. You can be super aligned educationally with a lot of different people, but like politically, not so much. And there we're all different and, you know, spiritually, religiously and all that stuff. And I say that because sometimes I recommend people and someone will come back and be like, <laughs> and, you know, and I'm like, girl, stay off her personal Facebook, stick to the blog. Okay. Her, her, her educational philosophies are sound, but you win. I didn't tell you to go look at her, her Instagram. So sometimes just know that I may recommend people that I don't even agree with in other aspects, but I respect their mothering. And for that, I can soundly recommend them. Um, you could go to a conference. Um, so the ones listed, I actually put the wrong picture for that last one, the Charlotte Mason educational retreat is over, but the four listed there haven't happened yet. And I'll be speaking at all of those. So you could say I'm a little bit biased, but honestly, those are like the four left this year. Um, and so going to a conference is, uh, is an awesome way to just get your feet wet and just dive in. Um, some of them are virtual or have a virtual option. And some of them are in person. Um, the nearest one to you would be the living education retreat is in Minnesota. Um, and you could also look at curriculum and the, there are so many, but you have like Charlotte Mason curriculum. That's like really trying to pull from her direct principles 
to the best of their ability. And then you have a ton of Charlotte Mason inspired curriculum. And I really like those two, but I couldn't list them all here. So I'm not trying to be snobbish by only listing these, but I am a little biased. I'm on the board of directors for the Charlotte Mason Institute. So yes, I put that one first. Um, and Simply Charlotte Mason, that's who I mentioned earlier is my mentor, Sonia Schaefer. And the Charlotte Mason Educational Center just full of women who are really steeped in Charlotte Mason, really rich. Um, and Ambleside Online are the OGs. Those are the women who originally blew out this woman's philosophy and made it into a curriculum for, um, for Americans and others as well. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not mention you could read my book. So it's uh, available for, available for pre-order. It's shipping next month. Um, and my book is called A Place to Belong. So it takes all of these kind of ideas that we're talking about dealing with this home atmosphere, but also combining it with that idea of that need to bring it forward to the 21st century and that our children can't just be like frolicking in sunflowers. They also need to learn to love their neighbors. So these are some of the things I talk about, how we can teach hard history in an age appropriate way and creating a diverse selection of books and media choices where our children can see other kids like themselves, but also other people. Um, celebrating cultural heritage through art and music and poetry, that's the balance to that hard history. Um, and then modeling activism and engaging in community service projects as a family. These are just the tip of the iceberg. I talk about world travel and language learning um, and you know about discussions to have in your home. And I talk a lot about as deeply committed as we can be to our children seeing themselves, to knowing that we see them and we love what we see and teaching them who they are and where they come from. So important, but equally important that we are pushing them and leading them towards um, making relationships and forging friendships with people who are similar in a lot of ways and different in other ways. Um, so there are um, portions of the book dedicated to my thoughts on cross-racial relationships and um, the need for us to build bridges among each other, uh, with each other. So um, if you are interested, if you go to a place to belong book.com, I have some freebies, some free bonuses that I think you'd really love um, for people who pre-order. So with that being said, I went over by three minutes, but um, hopefully that was good. And I would love to know if you guys have any questions. I have a million questions, but I don't want to be the hog of the microphone, but I'll start. Okay. So um, when you were talking about short lessons, I get that. But what would a day look like? How many lessons would you be doing? Um, can you just kind of guide me through what a day would look like with your kids? Yeah, so we would get up, we would have breakfast and we would do Bible and hymn and poetry and then we do recitation where they learn to speak beautifully maybe a poem or a bible verse or something like that um and we might do a composer study and then I, you don't do all these subjects every day so another day we might be doing a picture study art or we might be doing art ourselves or something like that um and then i may read u.s history and then my older kids world history and we'll do geography um and we would have math um, we may do natural history or one of the sciences, um, and then perhaps current events, and um, maybe they'll be doing all the narrating in between and then like literature. So it could be like a historical fiction or just a regular fiction novel. And the next day they'll do something similar. It could be Bible, sing a folk song, read a poem or a couple of poems, do a picture study, um, do their math do a different aspect of science, do grammar that we didn't do yesterday, um, and read a biography, read some cultural history or heritage history. For us, that would be black history. Um, and we may draw, do some drawing or whatever we're working on in art and watercolor, um, perhaps a handicraft, maybe a little crocheting or something that we're working on there. 
um, and you know, so on and so forth like that. So the lessons are short and they just flow one into the other. She talked about trying to get children to use different parts of their brains. So you wouldn't be like, you're gonna do math and you're gonna do US history, and then you're gonna do world history and then you're gonna write. And then you're, you know, it wouldn't be like that. So they would be doing something a little easier, something a little harder, something where they're singing or moving and then something where they're writing perhaps. So like that, and I have a schedule, but it's not timed. So it's more like a routine. So I know on Mondays, these, this is the way we do it. Like we go from here to here, to here, to here, to here. And then whatever doesn't get done just doesn't get done. And then I'll start with that the next time. Okay, I'll just keep hogging the microphone because I have lots of questions. So if you um, grew up like me with zero handicrafts, what do you do? How do you start? What would you suggest? Well, a couple of things. One, I would, you know, to get started right immediately, I would pick a life skill. Like I would do like um, gardening, like herbs in a pot in the windowsill, you know, something really easily, um, something uh, or like making greeting cards or something like that, learning about stamping um, or writing beautiful like calligraphy or something like that. Um, those are usually really accessible because you can get a book or a video, but also I am all about kits. So all of the things that involve like a needle that my kids learn to do, they learned on a kit. So on Amazon, like if I wanna teach them a cross stitch, I get a cross stitch kit. It's like a little plastic needle with some yarn or maybe a bigger metal needle with embroidery thread. And there's like a pattern and it says, do this. And then I like do this and do that. And I really like those because they come with all the supplies um, and they have all the instructions um, and things like that. So. Um, also, you know, I use YouTube a lot, um, to see like, like when we started working with clay, there's this one clay book, clay modeling book that all good Charlotte Mason families use. I tried, I really did. My kids were like, we really hate our lives every time we sit down to use this book. And I was like, I'm so sorry. It was so boring. And so I switched over and we kept doing clay, but we started doing YouTube and Again, one of my kids totally took to it and she's been making amazing things out of clay ever since. So, you know, sometimes you just kind of got to go the pop culture way to get it in there and then you can work with it a little bit more and, you know, as you go. But yeah, kits are my life. Also classes or a teacher, like right now, I cannot watercolor. That's a very big confession for a Charlotte Mason mom because they are really known for being excellent watercolorists. And I have tried and it's very bad um, no matter what I do. And so like there is a woman who comes to our house every Thursday at 10 and she does watercolors with my children. So things like that too, help. <laughs> I have a question, but I don't know how to do this. I'm not very Zoom. I don't even know if I'm... I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I'm an unlikely homeschooler, public school teacher prior. Um, and then I just, I ended up with a really diverse family. So I really, really appreciate all the books you share. I can't thank you for how many I snapshot your Instagram like all the time and I, I really just appreciate all the books you share and just lots that you share but my question is so I'm starting with my second set my 28 year olds and so homeschooling is really lovely we do a lot together you mentioned um reading is important we kind of just read together all the time like do you actually when do you like assign your because I don't give them assignments really yeah. when do you like have your kids read like they read for fun and we read together but I've never really just told them to read, like, or given them an assigned reading. When does that kind of start? Just okay, from your so as you're going, you're right at the cusp, like for me, right? When you're going into this next school year, you'll start thinking about, I have an eight-year-old too. And so I'm just now kind of giving him like, okay, I want you to go over there and read the next chapter in this book, but we're almost done with the book. You know, he, we've been reading together. He's reading aloud to me. I've been reading to him. Um, and so we're just now getting to that point. So Charlotte Mason would say that you want your children to read as many of their school books on their own as they can as soon as possible. But that doesn't really mean like 
as soon as they can read a book, but more as soon as they can read good books on their own and fully understand them. Um, and even though, uh, but even my child who's going to be a teenager this year, she'll be 13. She st we still read together. I'm reading a book to her right now, um, one of her school books, and she reads aloud to me, but she does read most of her stuff on her own. So it's just a gradual, but because I have an eight-year-old, I can tell you that for me, it's that nine is where I start. start. I don't just say, okay, now you read all your stuff on your own, but now I'll, I'll look. And when I choose the books for, for next, for the fall, I will be like, these books he'll be reading on his own. And these are books I'll read with him still. Thank you. You're welcome. You have a beautiful family. Thank you. Well, I'm going to tag on that. Cause one of my questions is about narration. So, um, when I ask my kids to do narration, I get a lot of pushback. And so, and you touched on this a little bit, but how do you teach your kids to narrate to you eagerly and excitedly? Okay, well, this is a good one. So, and when you think about, I always try like when I have it, cause I, I originally had that issue too with my kids back a while back. And, and I'm like, what is going on? Why all this pushback? But if you think about it, Charlotte Mason, um, she's training her teachers and she's saying they have, the kids have to narrate after everything they've read, but it was a classroom. So every child didn't narrate everything. Everything was narrated but every child didn't narrate everything. Now we bring that into our home context and we use her same words and we're like making that exact child or those children narrate everything. And so what I like to do is mix up their narrations. They are gonna have to do some oral narrations and when they get older written, yes, of course, but we have a narration jar where they can choose um, like a, a what do you call it? Popsicle stick that has it on there. They can act it out. Some of them are draw a picture. Um, my da daughter, who's really into dolls, she can arrange her dollhouse in a scene and tell me when she's ready. Um, you know, so there are like different things like that. And we even have one that says that you got to tell it, you can wrap your narration. So when my kids were doing Rembrandt, they got together and they had me leave the room and I came back and he ended up losing, he ended up poor at like all artists at the end of his life back then. And they were like, you know, something, something. He was broke, broke in the Baroque, Baroque, because he lit, painted during the Baroque period, you know, so I, little things like that. And they had so much fun and I was cracking up laughing at that. Um, so I think varying it that they don't just have to give this like rote oral narration every single time. And then sometimes I just don't make them narrate. They don't have to narrate any of their free reading or fun reads. They don't have to narrate our family read alouds. It's really just their school books and we, we mix it up. They can do a video too. One of my daughters, I put, put that on Instagram one time as a while ago. She did a video. I wasn't in the room. She narrated into the video like she was a newscaster. And then I watched it later and it was excellent. It was really, really good. So I think things like that. That's super helpful. Can you just tell us too, when you have your kids start writing their narrations? So my kids start in fourth grade with one narration a week, one written narration a week. Um, and that's older. I mean, that's a kind of short, amazing thing. We are, you know, then if I compared my kids to their, their, my friend's kids who are in school, it would look like they're like way, way behind, but it's, it's just, it works. It's like potty training. I potty trained my kids late. My friends, all their kids were potty trained, but they took a long time. I waited till my kids got older. I'm like, listen here, you got to go in the pot. Okay. We're not going to have the diapers anymore. We're kind of done. Like just your big kid, let's go in the pot. And then they went in the pot. <laughs> and so like, you know, I wait until I'm later to do stuff, but my kids get it quickly. And so yeah, fourth grade, they do one near one written narration a week. And a lot of times I consult with parents and, and they're like, I don't mind. I'm trying to get my kid and they won't do it. And I'm like, well, what are they doing? They're like, well, they only have to do three or four a week. And I'm like, but she's in second grade. And so the, that's a, that's a lot for a second grader. So, yeah. Super helpful. And I'm glad you said that about potty training. I'm the same exact way and no shame. Um, and our school requires work samples to um, upload. And so all of these narrations are beautiful work samples for your sponsor teacher. So I'm just throwing that out there because um, a lot of times Charlotte Mason, you feel like I don't have any work samples. I don't have anything, but you know, a recording or a picture, or all of these narrations are just such great work samples. And um, we teachers like to see those sorts of things because they're so creative too. So somebody else, anybody else have a question? Uh, 
Okay. Well, I think I could probably ask you questions for the rest of eternity, but I just want to say thanks for coming. Thanks for throwing all this information out for us. This was a beautiful introduction. And um, I also just want to thank you again for what you Instagram and what you write, because it's such a unique voice in the Charlotte Mason world. And um, my family loves you. So thank you. Keep, keep sharing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come and share what I love with everybody. And for those of you that are here or will be listening later, I just really appreciate you. Thank you. Well, the feeling is mutual. We love you. Thank you. And everybody, thank you for showing up. Have a wonderful afternoon. It's afternoon here in Alaska. Yes. Um, <laughs> have a wonderful afternoon and um, go outside. <laughs>